started. Hi, Mr. Anand, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hello, everybody. Welcome, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Abu Dhabi University, we're very happy to welcome you to today's session. We'll um, just wait a couple more minutes for people to join. We will start around 4.03. All right, it's 4.03. I think it's time for us to begin. Uh, good afternoon, nice to see so many of you join us. I'm beginning to recognize some of these names who are, who are here this afternoon. I definitely remember you, Tanzil, and I think Marco, you also joined us earlier. So welcome to both of you. Um, we're so happy that you're with us this afternoon. Um, I want to point out very quickly that this afternoon session is actually <clears throat> Um, targeted towards teachers, um, because we're really going to be talking about uh, understanding metacognition strategies and how to make your students, uh, you know, more successful learners um, by understanding how the brain works. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and we're going to start today's session. So here we go. Rahman Rahim. We can I can share my screen with all of you. There you go. All right. And we can see it. Excellent. Okay, thank you. So um, today's session is being presented by myself. I'm Dinaz Kanji, and my co-presenter is Mr. Walid Isan. Um, I'm, we're both faculty members at Abu Dhabi University College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and we're so, so, so happy to welcome you all today. Thank you for joining us once again. Um, Mr. Walid, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Dinas. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I welcome all of you. We are really excited to have all of you and uh, for this presentation. So what we are going to learn a, a today about is the, how does the brain work? So the outline of this workshop goes like, first of all, how do we process some information and not other? Because 
we know that we do not process all kinds of information. The second one is about the information process theory. And then how can we implement this topic for, uh, for being a teacher? And the last one is that who said that we are smarter than all of, uh, all of the creatures on the earth. Moving on. Okay, so before we start to learn about how does the brain work, it's important to understand why we have to learn this. So we have got an activity here that we are going to do. So first of all, we are going to show you a list of words, which will be shown to you for 30 seconds. You have to read them and try to remember most of them, and then we'll ask you to write them after 30 seconds. Okay, so we're not going to show it to you for 30 seconds. We're gonna show it to you for 15 seconds. Um, we don't want you to take a picture of the words. You can't write them down. There's no cheating allowed. This is an, this is an on the spot <laughs> exam for you, the teachers, so that you know how your kids feel. When you, when you turn up to class and say, hello, pop, pop quiz today. <laughs> So you know how they feel. So now we're gonna turn the tables and do it to you. See how you feel when we say quiz time. So here we go. We're going to show you a list of words, no taking pictures, no writing them down. It's pure memory work. Are you guys ready? Let's go. done all right all right so now you need to write them down there were 10 words and now you and you have to write the words down that you remember let's see how many of the words do you remember please do share how many words did you remember? And we'll be sharing the screen again for you to know at least if you remember the right words or not. Uh, no, don't write them on the chat. Uh, we no, want to see chat. How, many, how many you remember, not what you remember. Okay. Wow, Hussam. Tanzil <laughs> remembers five. Okay, Marco remembers five. Saad remembers six, Dima remembers five, Neda remembers five, Shireen, one, two, three, four, five, six, Safa, six, Kamil, three, Rania, five. All right, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again. Yes. And try and see which ones you remembered and which ones you forget. I want to ask the person that remembered nine whether you actually have uh, a photographic memory or whether you copied them down or whether you took a picture when we told you not to. Uh, he actually did remember them. Good for you. We want to know your <laughs> secret because we don't. I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So I want to talk to you specifically. All right. Okay. Mr. Wali, do you want to tell us about something? Okay, so now that we surprisingly tell everyone that you have to remember words, we weren't prepared for it. We didn't have any strategies and everything, but now that you have gone through it once, now if we show you another list of words, you'll be able to remember more of them. So okay. shall we, shall so we we're gonna run this experiment again. Except this time. Now, now, one thing I want to ask you, what do you notice about this list of words? Before we move on to the second part, what do you notice about this list of words? You can write on the chat or you can raise your hands. And the names of animals, yeah, well done. They're only names of animals, there's nothing else, right? The list would have been a bit more complicated if we had taken different things and put, put those in so it, they said a uh, dog, chair, telephone, house, uh, gardening hose, it would have been different. But you already, your brain already prepared you that this was a list of animal names and therefore your brain already classified it as a list of names of animals. Now, let's move on to the next one. Okay, so now we're gonna show you another list 
And now we're going to give you 10 seconds, no taking pictures, no writing them down, just figuring out how you will remember this list. Okay, can you, without telling everybody else, write them down again and tell us how many you remember. Nida, six, Tanzil, five, Safa, seven, Dr. Alia, seven, Kamil, five, Dolat, five, Hassan, seven, Tanzil, yeah, they were all fruits. Fruit. Well done. <laughs> and were they all just fruits or were there a particular kind of fruit? Or a particular kind of fruit, except for apple and maybe strawberry and maybe banana. The rest were all kind of tropical fruits. All right. So um, question for you. Did you remember more the second time than you did the first time? For how many of you? Um, remembered more the second time than you remembered the first time. Okay, one more Safa, Siti, Hassan. Okay, second time was better. Okay, excellent. So for those of you who remembered more the second time, can you tell us why you think you remembered better? And you can raise your hands and we'll allow a couple of you to speak. Why do you think you remembered more the second time? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hassan. Okay, good. Okay, Tanzil. Okay, because you were mentally prepared. Good. Marco used the pattern from before. So Hassan and Tanzil and Marco are on the right tracks. Dima, okay, well done. So you're already using some metacognition strategies. One is preparation. Good. Experience. Good. Classification. Excellent. Uh, focus. These are all examples of, uh, of metacognition strategies. You knew in advance what you had to do. Well done. Yes. Preparation. Absolutely. These are really, really important points that you are all pointing out. Okay. Um, let's move on. Yes. Let's move Mr. on Willi. to the next one. Let's move on to yes. the next one. And now we are changing our practice. And we want, to we want you to observe something else. Now, what makes information meaningful? So here are three sentences that you should go through. And first one, second one, and third one, take your time. And we have a question after that. Okay, I think let's move to the next slide. Which of these sentences was e easiest to understand? Was it sentence one, sentence two, or the, or the third one? So this is the first one that starts with Ra Ross, the second one, which starts with two finger John shoots. And the last one is my home is not where I say it is. Which one, which information was the, the most meaningful? The one that you could easily remember. All right. So most of us, we, we are stuck between the second and the third one. And the reason is because the, we remember what makes sense to us, right? The first one is, is even hard to pronounce what the words are. We don't even know the words. The second one, because we know the words, but it still doesn't make any sense. But we all remember the third one because it is grammatically correct and it, it and makes complete sense. That's why we remember the third one. And that happens everywhere as well. Information that is easy to get, easy to understand, 
the one so for example we we know how how letters are arranged in specific manner to pronounce a word what are words what are what is grammar that's why the third information was easier for us to remember instead of the second one which was grammatically not correct and not making any sense so we were not able to connect the dots and the first one was for aliens this is the point over here okay thank you mr Balis, for that explanation so i want to ask i want to ask the teachers in the group how many of you have heard of a very important education psychologist by the name of Jean Piaget. How many of you have heard of this super, super important education psychologist by the name of Jean Piaget? And I'm gonna put his name in the chat so that we are all, we are all, um, we all understand which name I'm trying to take, Jean Piaget. No? Okay, so Jean Piaget was a French education psychologist. Okay, I'm glad a couple of you have heard of him. So Jean Piaget was an, was an education psychologist who actually spent about 50 years of his life trying to understand how people learn. How do human beings learn? And in fact, he, he came up with a very important theory, which says that when human beings are born, when children are born, there are certain instincts in them which are natural to them. And they don't need to learn these instincts. So for example, sucking, for example, holding on to something or moving away from something. These are instincts that are inborn in new children. Everything else, everything else from walking to using a computer, to driving a car, to designing a football, everything else has to be learned by human beings. And essentially what he said is that he, through his observations and through his, his experiments, he learned that human beings, essentially what they do is that they build information block by block. So they have an piece of information that they observe, they hear, they see, they read, and essentially it, they, they build a building block. Once that information is understood, when the next time they see, they see another piece of information that kind of looks like it or sounds like it, they add it to the existing piece of information. And this is how, um, what he refers to this as schemas. Schemas are built in the brains of human beings. And essentially, every time we, 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 we come across new information, we add it to our existing schema. Our schema accommodates the new information, um, assimilates the new information, accommodates it, and grows. So this is a very, very important theory of Jean Piaget, and he calls this theory constructivism. So basically, the reason why we were able to understand this third sentence is because we have existing schema that tells us that when something begins with a capital in a sentence, it's the beginning of a sentence, um, you know, M-Y that says, is pronounced my, um, H-O-M-E, you know that when you have an E at the end of a letter the, and the vowel in the middle becomes long, so you, you know it spells home instead of home. So essentially, we build on our existing schema to make sense of everything around us. Because we knew the grammar, we knew how to read, therefore this, sense, this sentence actually made most sense, okay? So the point here that we're trying to make is that what makes information meaningful is if we are already using our known schema. Whatever we already know, when we add to that, when we utilize that, that's when learning becomes meaningful. Now, everything that Mr. Walid and I are saying to you this afternoon, we want you to think about what that means in the context of your students and your classroom. Okay, so as we move on with the presentation, we're going to talk about how human learning is about making sense out of information. So essentially, human beings 
observe things in the world, they see, they hear, they read, they make sense out of it, they sort it, they use the existing information and then they bring new information to, to assimilate new learning. Okay, so this is how learning actually happens. So for example, if you think about if you're math teachers and you're in the classroom and you're thinking about, I need to talk to my students, my primary school students, my nine or eight, nine-year-olds about multiplication. They cannot do multiplication until they've understood that multiplication is a short form of adding a series of numbers. Right, so they, you can only do multiplication once they've learned addition. This is why learning happens in this sequential manner, okay? All right, let's move on to talking a little bit about brain research. What is brain research showing us today? Mr. Waleed? Okay, so brain research talks more about the same thing that we were saying, that Amount of stimulation in an individual's development relates to number of neural connections, which are important for higher learning and memory. As Ms. Dina said, that we learn in terms of blocks. So we, we set blocks and then another block and another block. So in the same way, it says that we have to learn of addition first, and then we learn about multiplication. So we cannot directly learn multiplication. This is what the brain research tells us. Secondly, we have to connect the information and the stronger the connection will be, better the understanding and memory will be. And environment plays a good role in it. So if, in, if the environment allows you to focus, if environment allows the students to focus and connect the dots between the memory, it will be, the, the end result would be better, right? The third point says brain becomes more efficient as we start to gain skills or build knowledge. As we gain more and more skills and more and more knowledge, more information that we get will be easier to connect with the previous ones, right? So if so initially we all start learning, writing a letter by letter, and then we start joining them. So one skill leads to another skill. In the same way, knowledge leads to more knowledge. And this, and this keeps going on throughout our life. We keep adding more knowledge, more experience, more skills, and it, it, it continues to grow our brain. Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Mr. Balid. So today, brain science, also known as neuroscience, is more advanced than ever before. And there's some really important learning that neuroscience is giving us today, which has really critical impact for teachers in the classroom. Um, and it's important not just for the students, but for you yourselves as learners. The first point I would like to I hope emphasize is that I hope that all of us as uh, teachers are also interested in, in continuing our, your, your own learning. And I think this is one of the reasons why you guys are here today is because this is a way for you to continue your own learning. So that's really important because what neuroscience is telling us today is the brain is a muscle like any other muscle in your body. And just as you, if you want to grow your biceps, you have to do certain kinds of exercises. You want to grow your leg muscles, you have to, grow, you have to do certain kinds of exercises. The brain also is a muscle. And the more you exercise your brain, the more it will develop. So the key here is to understand what are the good exercises for brain muscle development, all right? Now, neuroscientists today are using a term that is super important for us to know as educators. And that term is neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity, which means that the brain is continually growing. The brain is continually growing. And I'm gonna put this in the, in the chat, neuroplasticity, all right? And basically it tells us that the brain and can stretch as far as you want it to stretch. How much it stretches is up to you. And essentially, you can continue to learn until a very, very, very old age. In fact, I knew somebody who went back to school, to university to get a master's degree in accounting at 80. 
This lady was 80 years old and went back to get a master's in accounting. She'd done her first degree from India in I think the 1940s. And then she waited a really, really, really long time. Um, and she decided to go back to school and get a master's degree in, in accounting. Isn't that amazing? So, you know, you never stop learning. And this is one of the big findings of neuroscience today that you never stop learning. Um, there's a great question in the chat, which is at what age does a child, um, should the child be able to start reading and writing? So Luciana, I want to say that, um, I want to say that um, it really depends on the child's environment. Um, some children, I mean, like I know, I know children who are reading The Economist magazine at the age of three. I would never recommend that you put your child through that at the age of three. Um, but, uh, you know, reading, and, and today, again, research is showing that the more you read to your child, the more language development occurs. And in fact, studies in the United States have shown that when a parent reads to a child from a very young age, they have about 1 million more words throughout their lifetime. Right, so it's really important to expose your children to books, to songs, to nursery rhymes, to songs from your own cultures. And I, and I wanna really speak, you know, I, this is not really the topic for today, but it's so important to expose children to your own culture, to let them become, you know, dual, dual culture children, because it's, it's very important that they have multiple cultures in their background and the more languages that they speak and the more they know about your own culture in addition to the English culture, the Western culture, I think it's really, really important. So to answer your question, it's never too early to expose children to books. Uh, I know friends who started reading to their children when the children were in their wombs. So you can play music to your kids when you're pregnant. You can read to them when you're pregnant. I think it's super important. I, I did all of these things and Alhamdulillah, I feel I have good kids now. <laughs> so um, I'm a testament to that. You know, I, I, I did, I, I have to say I did all of these things for my children. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to uh, something that's called the information processing theory. And there are several theories about how the memory works, how the brain works, okay? Uh, Willie, do you wanna, do you wanna take a stab yeah. at this or do you want me to go yeah. for it? Okay, so a Ginson and Schifrin model explains how the memory works, right? And they have divided the memory into three parts. The first one is sensory memory, the second one, short-term memory, and the last one is long-term memory. The good thing is that one memory leads to another, right? So just like any input device, sensory memory is the input device. And from where it does get the input is are the five senses that we have. The sound, sight, smell, touch, and taste. These five senses help us to get reactions which go to sensory memory, right? And if we give attention to each of those actions, it turns out to be a short-term memory. With rehearsal and practice, by revising the information that we have received, we can store it into a long-term memory. And from the long-term memory, we can retrieve it back to short-term memory and then use it. So this is how the memory works. Now, why is it important to understand how the memory works is because we need, we need to ensure that the students record the information probably, uh, properly and they can recall it when they need it. That's the exams and the, and the application of the information. So that's why we ask the students to use more of their senses to get better information and then practice it especially if we talk about the languages and the math courses, we emphasize a lot on rehearsal because that is the way we can take the information from short-term memory to the long-term memory. More we rehearse, easier it will be for the students to recover it from their long-term memory. And more 
if we go back to the practice that we had earlier, where we just asked you to read the words and remember them, if we would have asked you to read and pronounce the words, you would have remembered better. And if we would have asked you to, and we would have given you more time, that you write those words, you would have rem remembered even more of the words from the list. So more senses that we involve, better it will be for us to, re to recover the information from the long-term memory. Yeah, very nice. So exactly. So essentially, this is just one of several theories of how the brain, how the brain remembers, right? What is a, what is a memory storage process? Um, and this is probably the most popular theory that we have right now. Um, although there are other theories, and essentially, what it tells us that at any given moment, the brain is absorbing information from the senses, from all the senses. Whether you're aware, or, aware of it or not, that's different. But the point is that your brain is processing sight, sound, smell, touch all the time. And, and what happens is that all of this goes into what is known as a sensory memory. This sensory memory lasts only 0.01 seconds. Unless you do something with that information, that information is gone. It remains in your memory for 0.01 second and then it's gone, okay? Um, and the key is to actually be able to focus, to pay attention. So whatever is, in, is important to you at that time, you pay attention to it, you focus on it, and then it moves to your short-term memory. Now, I just want to speak about this very quickly. I can be in a class for like 90 minutes. My students are not listening to me. The minute I mention in your exam, everybody stands up and starts paying attention. Why? Because at that point, I said something meaningful to them. They didn't care about the 89 minutes of talking, right? But the minute that I said, now we're going to talk about your exam, they were immediately interested, all right? So at that point, they paid attention to what they were listening to. Um, okay, so essentially, information then gets stored into your short-term memory, which lasts just a little bit longer, 0.05 seconds. If you don't do anything with this, again, it's lost. The key here is to keep information in your memory over a period of time to move it into your long-term memory. How does that happen? As Mr. Walid has said, if you rehearse and you use certain metacognitive strategies, which you're going to teach your students, then they will remember how to, re how to re remember. And then the key is to recall. Now, what neuroscience is telling us today is that um, students, people will never forget what they have learned. People never forget, but recall is something different. Remember is something different from it being embedded in your memory, okay? And sometimes, especially with age, and I can attest to this, you, you cannot always recall everything. It takes time to recall things, okay? But it's, it's always that once you actually learn something, it never, ever goes. Okay, um, let's talk about this very quickly. Um, Again, in the 1960s, lots and lots of experiments were done on the brain. Um, and basically, there was an important, um, important educational psychologist by the name of George Sperling, who basically wanted to show the, the existence of something called the visual sensory memory, which means what you see, right? So how, how long can you remember what you see? All right, so he wanted to see um, how, how, the duration of time that people remember what they see and also how much they remember what they see. Okay, so what he did was he did this experiment with them and essentially he showed them this, this, this group of letters and he asked them to remember just the first line and he gave them a few seconds to look at the first line and essentially he asked them to recall then he asked them to do the second line then he asked them to do the third line and basically what his experiments showed because he did a lot of these experiments it showed that we see and register just the top and the bottom letters 
Um, so what is in the middle, we don't remember, but what is at the top and the bottom, we will remember because this is what your brain sees first and last. It stores these in the memory, but the memories fade too quickly for it to be recalled. This is why in this list of words that we gave you at the beginning, chances are, chances are you remember the first three and the last three, and over here too, you remember the first three and the last three and probably forgot, forgot the, um, the words in the middle. It's because this is how your brain works. This is when you were reading that list, you were using your visual, visual sensory memory. And essentially, um, the fact that you have a memory that fades, your visual memory fades very quickly. Um, this is referred to you as your iconic memory. And this is why when you, when you see things, you know, especially in a court of law, uh, when, when, when um, witnesses are asked to come and tell us, what did you actually see? This is why the defense lawyer will keep pushing back. Did you see this or did you see this? Are you sure you saw this or did you see this? It's because scientifically it's been proven that our visual memory is very, very short. It's extremely short. You can't really see things. Um, you can't really remember things for too long. Okay, so let's talk about your short-term memory. It's also called your working memory, all right? Now, your working memory, which is your short-term memory, the, the middle compartment essentially categorizes or takes in the information that your senses have passed on to it and which you think is important. Now, this is where your memory organizes the information. So information is coming in, and what you're doing, your memory is doing, it's either organizing it or keeping it, all right? So if it's something you've already learned before, it attaches itself to that information you know from before. Remember Jean Piaget said we have schemas, we build on existing knowledge, right? So if you have found something that's already existing, your new information attaches itself to it and basically becomes stronger and more embedded in your memory. Your brain is doing something very, very, very rapidly and it's taking in information, organizing or, or throwing it out. So these processes are happening very, very, very quickly and simultaneously so fast that you don't even know it. Okay, and essentially your brain is keeping information, it's organizing and keeping information based on how actively you use your working memory. So the more that you use your working memory, now that you've learned about how the brain works and the more you think about the three compartments, sensory memory, short-term memory, Long-term memory, the more you keep thinking about this and reflecting about it, the more it gets embedded in your existing, it becomes new knowledge. And the more that you think about it, it adds on to that body of knowledge that you already have. Now, here is, here is the, the, the $60,000 question. How long can things stay in your short-term memory? The answer is not that long because your working memory has limited capacity. So essentially, this is why your, your brain is discarding information that you don't no longer use, right? Because your brain is taking in information, sorting it out, keeping some, throwing out others, and new information or old information can be forced out by new information. So for example, how many of you remember your last phone number? How many of you remember your previous phone number? You probably don't remember it because you probably don't need to use it any longer. Okay, so what has happened is that your brain has thrown out this information that is no longer necessary. All right, today I was trying to do something for my son and I couldn't remember my e-life number. Um, and I'm like, really, what is my e-life? And this is why I forget my passwords because I don't use them. So 
this is why somebody like me has to write down all my passwords because I don't use them that often to remember them because my brain has other information that is more relevant and necessary for me. Okay, so we have to remember that your working memory is limited and it's constantly being reorganized. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear this? Can no. You, can you, no. 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 Okay, I need to share the audio, um, which I do not know how to do. Um, okay. Ms. Fida, can you tell me how to share my audio? Okay. Maybe I'll just skip this one and I'll come back to it when I figure it out. Okay, let's let's move on. This is about why your 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 um why your brain processes some information and not other. Okay, right. So here we go. Dun, dun, dun. Here is a big news for today. All right. Without rehearsal, your information remains in your brain for thirty seconds and then is lost. Your brain remains in the, in, so you're, you're, if you're without, without using the information that is in your head, um, it remains in your head only for, in your short term memory, only for 30 seconds, and then it's lost. This is why, if you remember here, we pointed out the importance of rehearsal. If you don't do anything with it, gone after 30 seconds. Machi, this is why um, using the information, processing the information is super, super, super important. All right, let's move on to talking about, sorry, well, Mr. Bolit, can you just take a look in the chat? I share computer sound, yeah, I share computer sounds from this setting, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll go back to that in a minute and, and, I, and I can use that in a second. Okay, so let's talk about Let's talk about our long-term memories now. Okay, so let's talk about our long-term memories. Um, so, first of all, the key key information here is that the long-term memory is unlimited. All right, um, but we're not always conscious of what is in our long-term memory. Um, so the idea is that we never forget anything we have learned, but we may lose capacity to find information. Like I said, recall is, is difficult. Information is there, but the recall becomes difficult. And theorists have actually, what they've done is that they've divided how the brain remembers, and they've said that there are three different um, parts to how your brain remembers. The first is called episodic memory. This is where you, you have your experiences, your memories of personal experiences, which were really, really strong. There are certain things <clears throat> that you never forget. Maybe the first time you had a car accident, maybe the time you graduated, maybe the time your child graduated. These are called episodic memories and you never ever forget those. The second is something called semantic memories. And this is where it's really important about the learning, okay? So this is where when your students are learning or you are learning, you remember the concepts, the skills, the rules, the problem solving, all of these are organized in form of a network of ideas. So for example, you know that when you see this sign, it means it's a plus. Your brain has embedded in your mind that two digits, when they're, when they're broken up by a, this sign, it's a plus sign, it means you have to add those numbers. This is semantic memory. Your, your brain has encoded certain information. It's made use of the symbols and signs that it sees in the environment. And essentially, it organizes these in the network of ideas. The third kind of memory is called procedural memory. Right, and this is very different from the episodic and the semantic. Episodic is, is, is memories of important events. Semantic memory, on the other hand, is knowledge, concepts, skills that you have learned and, and your brain has organized these in a network of ideas. And the third is your procedural knowledge, knowing how to do something. So for example, knowing how to ride a bike, Knowing, for example, when you sit in the car, you know where to put the, your car key, 
you check your mirrors, some mirror signal maneuver, right? These are things that your brain has encoded, you know, without ever having to think about it, this is what you have to do to start the car. Or for example, when you wake up in the morning, you have a certain ritual. Your brain has made it kind of natural to you because it, this is procedural. You're following a series of steps. And the more you do this, the more your brain, your, it, it gets set in your long-term memory, okay? So to summarize, your long-term memory is, is, is permanent, right? You, are, you, you never forget what you learn. And I'm emphasizing the word learn. It's broken up into three parts. What you have is your episodic memory, i.e. memories of important events to you. Second is your semantic memory. These are your concepts, your skills, your knowledge, which are organized in a network of ideas. Third is your uh, procedural memory, knowing how to do something, all right? Knowing how to do something, okay? So this is basically how your long-term memory is is organized. Okay, Mr. Walid, you wanna tell us how to improve long-term learning while I look at the questions? Mr. Walid, can you hear me? Can't hear you. Okay, you're on mute. All right, so let me talk about how to improve long-term learning. Okay, so essentially, as educators, we need to know that there are certain strategies we need to use in class to improve the long-term learning of our students, okay? And essentially, studies have shown that when students are sitting in a class, they lose 54% of information that they're learning. Whereas students who learn through doing something, they, they lose only 13% of information. This is why there is so much emphasis now on, in education on making students apply their knowledge. So to take what they have learned and to apply those in a particular way. So to learn by doing, all right? So this is basically how we wanna make sure that our students actually increase their, uh, their, their memory by doing something. So now we're going to look at, we're gonna move into the second part of our presentation today, <clears throat> which is looking at how to use different kinds of metacognition strategies for our students. The first and most important thing is something that we call practice. All right, it's super important for, to make our students practice what they are learning because we want them to use that knowledge over and over and over again because we want it to become part of their semantic long-term memory. And the way that you do this is you make them practice what they have learned, right? This is why in primary classrooms, um, or when you're learning a new language, you are told to keep using the new vocabulary over and over again. Now, there are different approaches to practice. As a teacher, you will use different kinds of approaches. The first is something that we call massed practice, all right? Where you make the students do something over and over and over again until it is set in the semantic memories. All right, it is constantly doing something. Maybe it's learning how to do fractions, or maybe it's learning how to put chemicals together in a class, or maybe it's learning how to use Microsoft Word or, or PowerPoint, whatever it is that we're teaching our students. The next kind of practice that we can do is distributed practice. Distributed practice is where you make the students do something every single day um, and you keep adding on to it. Um, and this kind of practice is, is good, but it's better to do, you know, especially when you're trying to get them to learn something new for the first time, then it's better to do mass practice and then to continue to add on to it. Once the students have learned a new skill or a new body of knowledge, then you do distributed practice, which is that you keep making sure that they don't forget what they have already learned. So for example, if they're learning how to do uh, division, you don't forget that they, they need to continue to learn how to do subtraction 
Or if, you've, if you're talking about fractions, then if you're teaching them how to multiply fractions, you still have them continue working on adding and subtracting fractions. <clears throat> and essentially when homework is given, this is the whole reason why we give homework is to make sure that you give this kind of mass practice or distributed practice. The most powerful kind of practice you can give your students is what we call investment, which is learning by doing, all right? And students learn more by doing something themselves than by reading instructions. And I think you all know this. Now, as teachers, there are other strategies you can use to improve memory of your students. Um, some, there's something called paired associated learning. Paired associated learning is where you basically teach them to associate two different ideas together, okay? So the first might be, let's say you want them to learn capitals. So you would say UAE and they would say Abu Dhabi, or you would say um, France, Paris, um, U UK, London. Um, Germany bond. So you basically you help, you're helping them to think about a response and a stimulus. Um, if you want them to learn biology, the learning parts of the human body, then you want to say um, clavicle, shoulder, metatarsal bone, right? So essentially this is how you're having them kind of associate, paired associate, associating um, a, a concept with a word. The other way that you can do, um, other, another way that you can use stra st an, an, another strategy to improve learning and memory is basically having them learn lists of things, all right? Or to have them associate images with locations. Um, so for example, just showing them pictures of something and asking them, where do you think this is? Or giving them timelines or order of operation in math. So it's to learn things in a particular order. Um, and then of course, the last kind of the last kind of memory strategy you can use is something that you call free call learning, where you don't want them to learn a list, but basically just want them to say, all right, tell me guys, um, which chemicals are in the periodic table? Or tell me guys, um, which countries are members of the United Nations? They don't have to necessarily recall a list or have paired associate learning. One of the most powerful strategies to improve your students' memory is something that we call mnemonic devices. Mnemonic devices is basically where you give them a pattern and they learn words based on pattern or ideas based on pattern. So for example, you want them to learn about the colors of the rainbow, there's a mnemonic device, and this is used particularly for very young students, six, seven year olds, when you want them to learn the colors of the rainbow, there's a mnemonic device that you can help them to use that. Um, here is an example of a mnemonic device, and this is to learn the um, to learn uh, measurements, distances, okay? So instead of remembering the order in which you start from kilometer and go all the way down. So starting from the largest measurement of distance to the smallest measurement of distance, instead of having students kind of struggle with remembering that, you can give them a beautiful mnemonic like King Henry died magnificently drinking chocolate milk, right? They're more likely to remember that, that how did King Henry die? He died magnificently drinking chocolate milk because every one of the beginning of these letters actually stands for one of the distances, uh, measurements of distances. All right, um, let me stop here and see if you have questions, if you have um, anything that you guys are writing in the chat that I'm missing. Um, I can't, I can't get to the chat right now for, for whatever reason. Yeah, there you go. Roy G. Biv, thank you so much. What is Roy G. Biv? It's the, uh, it's the alphabet. Yes. I don't know. What is the PEMDAS? What is PEMDAS? Can you, Marco, what is PEMDAS? Uh, what is this? What is this a mnemonic device for? If you can write in the chat, that would be great. All right. Um, let's move on. These are other theories that I don't really want to talk about, but here are really important things. Um, I think that is important for us to learn 
um, as, as educators, there are certain instructional strategies that you can actually use to improve your students' learning. The first is something that we call active learning. Okay, active learning is when you have deliberately built a lesson where students are learning. You can use discussions. You can, you can, um, oh dear King Philip came over for a good spaghetti. All right, but what is, what, what is this for? Uh, Marco, what, what is this mnemonic device for? Okay. So let's talk about active learning. Active learning, you can have many, many, many different strategies for active learning and critical thinking. Um, I want to suggest that a really good active learning strategy is the use of discussions and the use of questions. If you can, if you can find really good discussion questions around the topic that you want to teach or around, um, ideas that you want to discuss in class, I think that's really, really important for you to embed those in your teaching. Definitely critical thinking by, for example, giving students an opportunity to read, reflect, and think about a critical situation. And to respond to that would be a good way for you to improve your students' learning. Definitely having students make presentations. I find that my students learn best when they are presenting because then they are forced to um, research, they are forced to summarize information and to put it in a meaningful format on a slide and then to discuss it with others. This is such a powerful way of uh, making sure that your students are learning, okay? Um, and there's a really important, um, really important um, strategy that I think gets overlooked. Information is the most meaningful to students when you link it to the real life situations. All right, you have to link information to real life situations. Um, so I feel that this is this is an important um, a strategy. So for example, when you're talking about measuring, um, Yes, you can teach your children how to, you know, your students how to measure something, but instead of just teaching them how to measure, ask them, how about we actually measure the, the perimeter of the classroom? Or can you measure the distance between your bed and your laptop? Or can you, instead of talking about just, um, I don't know, something around, let's say, something around, um, cooking and you're teaching them you know measurements of weights and um, things tell them let's go and cook something so that it actually forces them to think about how to use measurements in real life or if you're teaching them about money ask them next time you go to the grocery store with your mother of course this is none of these are covid related i mean we can't do this during covid but in in non-covid circumstances definitely we can use this next time you go shopping with mom pick up three things in the shopping basket and do a mental addition to see how much mom is spending um approximate how much she's spending all right um so it's important for us to always link what they are doing to real life situations so for example when i'm teaching my students a class on how government is organized i do use examples from um, you know, what is happening around the world to talk about, look at how governments are organized, how are they responding to certain situations. And, you know, looking at government responses to COVID is a really good way for them to understand how governments um, look after the needs of their people. So I always try to bring in real life information to see, you know, this is active learning, it's critical thinking, it's linking to real life situations. I try to do all of those. I to always also bring in practical tasks. So like I said, what they learn by doing um, is the strongest form of, um, strongest form of uh, learning that your students can have. Um, all right. Um, so I think Dr. Alia is asking a question. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to that. Yeah, you're asking such 
a critical question, Dr. Alia. Um, how can we work to develop neuroplasticity in light of a lifestyle of our students that is far from ideal for physical health? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a really, really, really huge question. And believe me, Dr. Ali, if you're teaching in a university environment, you know that something like this becomes worse and worse as the students get older because they're in charge of their own lives and they can basically eat and sleep what, what sleep whenever they want and eat whatever they want. Yeah, for sure. Um, this is why it's important, I think, for older students and even younger students for you to talk to them that, you know, your brain develops, but it needs certain, it needs certain environments. And we talked about environment at the beginning, right? Um, uh, we talked about the importance of the environment. Uh, and this is why we know that when, when, when children are in traumatic environments, they never learn. They can't learn because their immediate environment puts so much pressure on them that it prevents the learning process from happening. This is why the learning and physical environment, psychological environment, health environment, those are so, so, so critical. Um, I know a couple of you have raised, have raised questions, uh, have raised, they wanna comment. Um, I'd love to invite Miss um, Feda. Can you can you unmute a couple of participants? Let them speak. Dr. Alia and Mr. Mohammed. I think they both have something they want to say. Um, I would love for them to add to this discussion. Um, how do we allow them to speak? As soon as they are allowed to speak. Okay. Okay. Dr. Alia. Dr. Alia, would you like to say uh, you, you, your, your, your point is so valid and I think Mr. Mohammed also. Dr. Alia, would you like to say something? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, could I speak Arabic or English? What you brief? Uh, um, if you can speak in English first, that would be great. Um, I, uh, yani, um, I use uh, well, translate. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Um, I used the translator Microsoft. It's okay for you or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. من خلال خبرة الوظيفية يعني في الجامعات مثل ما أنت تفضلتي كان يعني الأستاذ كثير يعني يعاني مع الطلبة يعني بعد الطلاب نظام نومهم في النهار. فبتيجي مثلا على محاضرة الصباح كثير مش مستوعبة أصلا يعني شو المدرس أو الأستاذ عم يتكلم ففعلا مشكلة يعني هذا هذه المباحث النظرية في البيئة التعليمية للأسف مفقودة بسبب نمط حياة للطلاب بعيد جدا جدا عن المرونة العصبية ومهما نحاول نقلع يعني نقنع الطلبة بضرورة الحفاظ على دورة نوم معتدلة مع شروق الشمس وغروب الشمس الابتعاد عن الأطعمة اللي بتدمر الدماغ ما يعني أظن إنه هذا رح يضل فقط نظري نظام يعني النظام الصحي للطلبة محتاج إلى وعي أكثر شكرا لك Thank you, Dr. Alia. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fida, do you want to translate in full? I got about 40% of that. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Alia was uh, talking about the, uh, their uh, sleeping, the sleeping pattern of the students. They're uh, not sleeping well at night. They're, uh, although the instructors are keep telling them about the importance of the good sleep, getting a good sleep, to be willing to come to their uh, the, to the university, for example, and come and be really in good condition to uh, take the knowledge from the university, especially in the morning. Uh, she's facing a problem with the students mm -hmm. coming. They didn't get enough sleep, so they're coming in the morning. They're really lazy and they're not 
uh, they're not fully awake to get the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, um, I just want to say that in certain countries, what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the time of school for students because they know this has now become <clears throat> a big issue. So I know certain countries are trying to have students come to school um, starting at 12 o'clock and going on to six instead of starting at, at 7.30 and finishing at 3.30, they wanna keep the school day aligned to the needs of the students. Um, and I don't think that, you know, we'll be seeing that kind of educational change very soon, but something has to change. Either the students' sleeping patterns have to change or um, the education system has to change. Yeah, I agree with you, Tanzil. You do, you do learn more in the morning, but you know, everybody's body clocks are very different. Some people actually learn more in the evening and others learn more in the day. So, you know, until now, the education system was very much geared towards a morning, morning pattern, but definitely, um, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some thinking around changing the time of school itself. Um, Mr. Mohammed, do you want to say something? You, you had raised your hand. Yeah, a couple of people have raised their hands. Go ahead. Um, go ahead and speak. Um, Fatin, go ahead. Yeah, hello. Hi. Uh, maybe I, I feel also that uh, the online learning or distant learning or the online courses that are being given, especially now in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, also helps in, in the uh, problem that... Uh, you were talking about as the student who could learn at, at his own pace. Uh, and maybe also some students may have psychological uh, needs or, uh, you know, some, some people uh, like to study alone. They're not such social mm -hmm. um, or they may be uh, very well into, they, uh, they like to be online all the time or they don't have a friends, uh, especially in these times when um, students have been about yeah. one year in quarantine. So yeah. maybe this could also be a, a positive aspect of uh, distant learning and online learning. Yeah, Do you agree? I agree, Fatin. As, uh, uh, you know, um, the distance learning situation has been favorable for some students and not favorable for others. Um, definitely, um, you know, it. it Distance learning helps students who are not social, like you said, who are not social learners. Definitely, that's true. Um, and, you know, being behind a screen, being anonymous, it helps them to kind of participate more. But it definitely also has had a major psychological impact on students who need to come to need to leave the home and come to another place to learn. Remember, we also have those we also have students who don't have access to laptops and computers or internet. So um, they also don't have access to, uh, uh, you know, their own learning environment, their own learning space. So there's definitely, you know, a wide range of needs and issues that distance learning has thrown up. But inshallah, yeah. it'll, it'll not be too long before we go back to normal. I think yeah. that there will not be a normal again. I think there'll be a new normal for sure. I, I would like to add something here, Ms. Dinaz. Sure. Another thing that matters a lot is the environment that the student is studying in. Yeah. Some students do not have that environment, mm -hmm. which is required for the attention and focus. That leads to another issue, which is the distraction. They have all kinds of distractions on their phones and laptops these days. So distance learning, as Ms. Dina said, turned out to be favorable for some, but not in all cases. Yeah. Um, okay, Mr. Mr. Mashaykh, do you want to say something? Do you want to say something, Mr. Mr. Mohammed? Okay. If not, I want to move on to talking about the last really important strategy to help students um, long-term learning. Uh, Ms. Vida, can you play the video? Uh, this, is, this is something called thinking. Um, and I'm sure a lot of us as educators already do this. 
if there are students in the group, and I know there are a couple, um, um, I know Tanzil is a student, and I know I think that um, um, Marco is a student. Here is a really, really great strategy for you to, to utilize um, in studying, and it's called chunking. And I'm going to show, we're going to show a video about chunking. Okay, so I've stopped sharing. Ms. Fida, if you can share and play the video, that would be great. Hi everyone, it's Yanis here and in this video we will explore what is chunking. Have you ever wanted to remember things easier? Then you should give a try to this simple strategy. If this is your first time on this channel, then make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon to get updates on my latest videos about time management and productivity. Chunking is the process by which individual pieces of an information set are broken down and then grouped together in a meaningful way. A chunk is a collection of basic familiar units that have been grouped together and stored in a person's memory. Imagine that you have to do the shopping and you have to buy a number of things like milk, coffee, dark chocolate, pepper, salt, oats, Oreo cookies, bananas and chili. You could chunk these items into the groups to create association and therefore ensure that you buy everything. Breakfast, milk, oats, bananas and coffee. Sweets, dark chocolate and Oreo cookies. Spices, pepper, salt and chili. Once you categorize the information or chunks, it becomes easier to remember it or recall when the information is needed. The chunks by which the information is grouped is meant to improve short-term retention and bypass the limited capacity of working memory. Here are a few techniques that you can use to practice chunking and improve your memory. First, look for connections. See if there are ways how you can connect the elements. For example, maybe there are three items and they all start with the same letter. Second, associate. When you try to remember something, it's easier to do so if you give the meaning to the items. Instead of trying to remember the list of ingredients, you can simply think about what meal you want to cook. Third, practice. More you practice remembering things, better you'll become at them and fewer mistakes you'll be making. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I was able to give you a quick overview of what chunking is and how it can help you to improve your memory. If you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate if you okay, could press the like the button now. as this will help the video reach more. Okay, so, so in essence, chunking is a really great strategy that you can utilize in your classrooms and I'm pretty sure you're already doing this, is where you take a big body of information, especially if you're teaching a lot of content, and you break it down into smaller and smaller chunks. And really the key here when you're doing your chunking is to ensure that it relates to something that either relates to real life situations that the children know about or you want them to know about so that the thinking is actually related to a real life experience. Um, one of the things that I don't do very well, but that's because, you know, I'm not very well informed about this, but is if you link your, your classes to the popular culture that, this, that the students are participating in. So for example, if there's a TV show or if there's a piece of music, I, I, when I'm teaching male students, I try to talk a lot about soccer because that is something I actually know about. So I try to link it to soccer, to soccer stars. I try to watch all the big European championship games just because I know my students are actually really into this and I kind of use examples from the world of sport to link it to their real life knowledge. Um, I, you know, some, some, you know, I'm not a big TV watcher, but I, when I do watch shows and I went and I ask my students, what Netflix shows are you watching? So I get a sense of what they like. I then link whatever information that I am giving, I, I link it to their real life so that they understand that there is a correlation between what I'm teaching and their own real life. So Chunking is a process of breaking down large bodies of information into smaller parts, and you make this more memorable 
if you link it to the if you link it to the lives of the students or you bring in experiences that help to engage their um, semantic memory so that you make sure you keep repeating something so that it embeds itself in their in their memories all right so these are some of the strategies that we wanted to discuss unfortunately we don't have time otherwise we could have spent a good 10 minutes talking about bloom's taxonomy i'm sure as educators we all know about bloom's taxonomy and the importance of ensuring that our students are not at the bottom bottom level of learning which is just remembering and understanding but that as part and even this can be done with the youngest kids we move them up to higher order thinking skills all right so we move them from lower order thinking simply memorizing you do need your students to memorize you do need your students to understand but once you have reached this level of understanding in your students then you need to push them up the taxonomy up the organization so that they begin to apply and then also analyze why they do what they do. Okay, so this is particularly important, I would say, for secondary school teachers um, and university instructors to ensure that you understand Bloom's taxonomy, you use it to your advantage, and make sure that you you move your students up this organizational structure as much as you can. How do you do this? You do this by asking the right questions in class. You do this by engaging students in discussions. You do this by asking students to make presentations and responding to a real life situation and saying, how do you evaluate this? Can you think of a new way to do this? Can you explain why you do this? So, you know, always pushing them towards engaging more and more of their critical thinking and their active learning, okay? Um, and, and maybe there's another whole session that we need to do on, on Bloom's taxonomy. All right. At the end, I want to say that there is actually a metacognition cycle. Different metacognition strategies apply themselves to different kinds of situations. First, you want to assess the task you want the students to do. Then you've got to evaluate the students' strengths and weaknesses. Remember, the metacognition strategies have to you, you have to utilize the strategies that are relevant to the needs of a student. Therefore, you need to know your students. If you know your students are really great at doing certain things, then you there, there are two approaches. Either you move them towards a mastery learning, really to master a concept very well, or to build on those things that they don't know too well. Okay, so it depends upon what you're working on. So you evaluate your students' strengths and weaknesses, you plan an approach. This is why you have your students work in cooperative groups. All right, so a group of students who are working really, really well together, who are the A group in the class, then you have your second group who have a mixture of A and B abilities, then you have your third group, B and C abilities, and then you have those students that actually need a lot of help and each group will need a different kind of metacognition strategy, okay? You apply your strategies and then you reflect, did this actually work or did it not work? So this is how you would actually, in a real life situation, in your classrooms, you would, in essence, you would actually um, work with the, with the students, all right? Um, we think we're the smartest, Actually, we're not the smartest uh, creatures out there. It's really the elephants who never forget. By the way, a very interesting story about elephants. Um, when somebody in their herd dies, they bury the elephant and then they come back the following year to visit the grave of the elephant. They never forget where they bury one of their family members, right? Compare this to my, my not being able to remember my e-life number this morning okay so in essence what we talked about today was we talked about why we process certain what makes information meaningful all right so i think uh, i think um, somebody had asked me to go back over the slides i think it was sadia um we talked about why we process some information and not on others we looked at the information processing theory and here specifically we looked at 
We looked at the brain research. We looked at the three compartments of the information processing theory, Atkinson's and Schifrin's model, where he says you have your sensory memory, you have your short-term memory, you have your long-term memory, all right? Um, your your short-term memory is essentially has limited capacity and new information forces out old information. Um, and then you basically looked at the importance of practice and rehearsal. Um, then we looked at the long-term memory and we discussed how the long-term memory is divided into three parts, your episodic, your semantic, and your procedural. Um, how do we improve information? How do we retain information through practice? There are different ways of practicing. Um, and then we talked about specific metacognition strategies, active learning, critical thinking, presentations, linking to real life situations, giving the students practical tasks, and then chunking the information. Okay, um, I can stop here and take questions or comments, uh, whatever you want to say. Now is your time. I think there are five comments or questions in the chat. Let me take a look. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, all right, I'm not able to go to the chat. Okay, right. Yes, Sadia, you asked for this, yeah? Uh, okay, I'm glad you found it informative. Tanzil, if I was to ask you a question, can, can we do a quick recall? Um, what are the three parts of the memory? <laughs> what are the three parts of the brain's information processing model? Let's see if we can do a quick recall on what we learned. Good, Manal, okay. Well done, Dola. Sh sensory, short term, well done. And the long, thank you, Hassan. Good job. The long term memory is divided into three parts. What are the three parts? Good, Hassan. Episodic, semantic, and procedural. Okay. Which, which part of my memory uh, never lets me forget that I can ride a bike? Which part of my memory never lets me forget that I can ride a bike? Not semantic. Well done, yes. Dolat. It was a procedural, well done. Which part of my memory uh, never lets me forget important events in my life? Mm -hmm. Good job, Hassan. Well done. You said it even before I asked. Well done. Okay. And therefore, the semantic memory allows me to do what? See, I've changed the question. The semantic <laughs> memory allows me to do what? Good, use of language, well done. Skills and concepts, good job. You guys are on a roll, you guys are good. Well done, okay, remember facts and rules. Yep, remember skills and knowledge, well done. Excellent, excellent, okay. Name me any two. Uh -huh. Name me any two metacognition strategies you can use. Any two metacognition strategies you can use. Okay, okay, yeah, assessing the task, yeah. Rehearsal, well done. Critical thinking and problem solving, well done, Hassan, absolutely. Planning, analyzing, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So practice, you can have different kinds of practice. You can have the students do role play. You can have students make presentations. You can do chunking. You can have them uh, use real life situations, yeah? Um, have students make presentations. These are all the different kinds of metacognition strategies that you can use in class. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to say thank you so much, Mr. Walid. Would, would you like to add anything? No, that's it. I just wanted to add one last question. Yes. For how long does the information stay in the in the sensory memory? Yeah, in the short term memory. In the short term memory. In the short term memory. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, well, the sensory memory does that does does stay there for that long for that long. Yeah. What okay. about the short term memory? How long does information stay in the short term memory? Yeah, 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Okay, that's it from my side. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's sessions. We have lots and lots and lots of more sessions coming up. I hope that you guys all join us for future sessions. Um, there's a huge range of topics that we're covering, and we really hope to see you one day at Abu Dhabi University taking a course with us. We would love for you to come and check us out. Thank you, guys. I'm glad you enjoyed Tanzil. Thank you, Hassam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keep, keep giving us that feedback. It's super important to us. It makes us feel good. <laughs> Thank you, Sadia. Take care. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. You too, Sad. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Yeah, I'd love to meet you too. Please come down to the university. We're always there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rana. That was so sweet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keep coming back to our sessions, please. Okay, I can stop sharing. Um, Ms. Fida, we can, I think we can end the session. Thank you, Shirin. Bye, Hassan.